To understand how a forest grows, or why and where a river flows, we must first go out and directly observe our environment. Field stations and marine labs connect scientists, educators, and communities to their environments by bringing the basic tools of science into the field. These living laboratories place scientists on the front lines of our changing Earth. But to fulfill their unique role, field stations must continue to evolve by adopting new technologies, developing even stronger networks, and incorporating more entrepreneurial leadership, field stations can meet the challenges of a rapidly changing world. City, mountain, prairie, desert, forest, ice, or sea. All of these environments are home to field stations. Though they range in size and scope, field stations are windows into ecosystems that provide unique educational and research opportunities. Away from the hustle and bustle of everyday life, field stations foster collaborations among scientists from different disciplines. Field stations provide hands-on, discovery-based learning for students of all ages. New tools, such as mobile apps, allow citizen scientists to collect data in unprecedented ways. But field stations are often overlooked for infrastructure upgrades and funding. We need to document the valuable roles field stations play in science and society with better metrics of their performance and impact. Long-term environmental data helps scientists to forecast change. More robust networks of field stations would make it easier to share these data and transform them into knowledge that aids decision-making. Imagine the potential of linking field stations to other organizations to pool data on the impacts of a regional drought, an extreme storm, or longer-term environmental changes resulting from human activities. Field stations have long been vital links to the environment through research, education, and community outreach. Harnessing their power and potential will help us better understand our shifting climate and ecosystems and create the knowledge we need to conserve the natural world. We'll go to my PowerPoint. You guys can jump in with questions, raise your hand, whatever. I'm very informal on speaking. Uh, am I speaking too quickly? No, OK. I talk really, really quickly. Um, so that's my name, Sarah Oktai. I do have a doctorate in chemical oceanography, so I have a special degree. Just I went to a college that was all about marine science. So um, my, my degree is studying the chemistry of the ocean. So most people, when they think of oceanographers, they all think of marine biologists, right? Um, I'm the person that works in marine biologist and with whale experts and stuff, but I'm looking to see what the water quality is where the whales and stuff are swimming. Um, and I'm with UMass Boston, and the name of my station is the Nantucket Field Station, and uh, then I'm the president of OBFS. So, next. Thanks so much for helping, too. Um, our challenges. So, right now, we have to worry about what we're doing to the planet. And we've been doing a lot of horrible things to the planet for a long time, which you guys are all aware of. We're harming the oceans, our land, and the animals and the habitats. We've got a lot of big issues like carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which are causing planet-wide chaos. So we're causing, through the use of fossil fuels, a buildup of a toxin in the atmosphere that normally, in small quantities, would be awesome. Um, but And it's a, a carbon dioxide. Plants can deal with it. Algae can use it. But we're putting so much into the atmosphere that, that it's going out of control. We're throwing off the balance. We've got small issues that I deal with every day, like septic system runoff. Do you know what a septic system is? Yeah, so this house and most houses, and probably some of your houses in Hawaii, and certainly Martha's Vineyard, your toilet goes to a holding tank, which may or may not have treatment, and then it goes into a gravel pit, and then it goes into the aquifer. And that's it. That's, I just named all the treatment for you guys. Your, your treatment is gravel. Your treatment is not cool, you know, uh, underground machines and robots that are clearing it or even a whole bunch of microbes, but typically it's just gravel. So one of the things we're trying to deal with is how to keep our poop out of the harbor. 
You would think it would be something we were pretty good at in the 21st century, but unfortunately we're not. So one of my jobs is to talk to people and get them to understand how we need to raise the level of technology and our responsibility on taking care of our own poop, because we're not cavemen. So um, other um, I work a lot with invasive species. That's obviously a big problem in Hawaii with invasive species, whether you're talking plants or animals that are taking over your, your areas of uh, flora and fauna. Those are plants and animals that come in and just grow out of control that don't belong on the island. So that's a big problem for both Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, and Hawaii, are invasive species. Um, we just passed a balloon act, and I know one of you guys here is going to be talking about the Martha's Vineyard Straw uh, program. We just managed to make illegal helium balloons on Nantucket. Uh, helium balloons, or lighter than air balloons, cause problems for marine creatures, uh, for whales and for seals. I'm also the captain for the clean team, and so we're picking up balloons all the time, and they're a bummer, uh, especially just for a kid's party. So we voted as an island to get rid of them. Um, there's all kinds of plastic pollution. One of the biggest problems that we have to worry about are algae blooms, and I'll show you some pictures of some algae blooms. We have so much nutrients going into the harbor and into the ocean that they tr cause these huge algae blooms, and these blooms are deadly. They can kill dogs, um, they can kill um, bivalves and shellfish, they can cause people to get Lou Gehrig's disease. They're not just uh, a nuisance, they're actually starting to have some toxic effects. We'll talk a little bit about that. And um, one of the things that I have to be concerned about and I go and talk to people all the time about is a lot of times big governments and adults are very slow moving and sometimes they're overly concerned about finances. They don't always understand a cleaner earth and a cleaner ocean saves money. So a lot of what I do when I go talk to people like let's say they over fertilize. I'll go talk to a homeowner, a multimillionaire. He tells his landscaper, oh just put as much fertilizer on as you want. I've got all the money in the world here. Here's $100,000. Well, I go to him and go, how about you spend 50000 and put half as much fertilizer and then it won't get into the harbor and then the rest of the island doesn't have to clean up the algae bloom you caused. So a lot of times the economy actually backs a cleaner planet. Personal economy backs a cleaner planet. But you have to help people understand that because a lot of times they think it's cheaper to pollute and it's not. Next. Hi guys, come on in. I'm not, I've had talks before where I had people like right at my feet so I haven't bitten anyone this week so we're in good shape. So. <laughs> But it's only, it's only Wednesday, so <laughs> There's, we got time. Um, Place-based research. So field stations support, sorry that it's kind of squished. Can you guys all see this okay? Yeah. Am I blocking you guys too much? Nope. I'll, I'll move back and forth like a cobra. Place-based research doing science in the field at the point where research and the public meet. So that is one sentence that ex explains what I do. I live here at the field station. We've got a big freshwater pond, a big bird's foot delta of sand. This is Folgers Marsh. I get to kayak that with my students every other week and take water quality samples. This side is all preserved, but I've got some big houses behind me and a bunch of big houses over here. Big houses even bigger than this house, like 20,000 square foot houses with giant green lawns like the third one from the right there. Ones that you can see the lawns from space. You know, that's bad. So. Um, Fortunately, I live at work. My office is right there. It's open to the public, so people walk right into my office, and I get to talk to them about what we're doing every day. And we have a ton of junior rangers that are 8 to 13 years of age, and they act as our nature docents, and they act as our little political bullies and sometimes, and explain to people why these plants are important, why these fish need to be protected, and why their septic systems are making everything gross. So um, this is literally where science and a place meet the public, and education. Does that make sense? So most field station directors are almost like state park people where they live on the place that they're studying, which is nice. So my commute is only about 40 seconds, um, which is really nice. I can go out at 3 in the morning and walk up and down here, which I do, and then go way back in here and I count horseshoe crabs. And I can do it on the high tide at 3 in the morning. If you're driving across an island or having to you know, go through traffic in New York City, it's kind of hard to go count horseshoe crabs. So it's nice to be able to work right where you live. Next. So here are the field stations that belong to the organization of uh, biological field stations. We've got 900 in the world, this many, and there's several, there's two in Hawaii, on the Hawaiian Islands, but this many in the world are active members. So being president, I don't get paid or anything, I just get to lead our, our meetings. And I speak in DC and I speak around the world on behalf of field stations. 
So um, I am, a lot of these other directors are, are really super famous scientists and really cool people, and I just do my best to present who we are to everyone. So I'm going to go to D.C. next week and talk about us to Congress, because a lot of people in Congress don't understand that we're providing the infrastructure for science around the country. So, yeah. There are a few, yeah, we actually have a lot in Costa, we have a hundred in Costa Rica, but you can't see them because we're blown up, but a lot of them, uh, our dues are only $100 a year, but I, for instance, adopted a couple of fuel stations in Costa Rica, because even a hundred bucks might be a lot. Some fuel stations, like mine, my budget's like 25000 a year, so I do a lot with a little budget, but we're trying to expand more into, you know, China and Russia have very specific problems because they don't understand the environment's important. So they'll have scientists, which I know is a little blunt, but um, they're getting there, but they're all about the economy right now, right? So there are scientists that work there, but for instance, they just started studying having birding clubs in China like four years ago, you know, where we've had birding clubs in Germany for 200 years. So just now people are going, hey, the environment, you know, environment's important. Before, people would go to, and there's actually a couple in Africa, we're trying to expand into Africa. The trick is there's a lot of conservation land, there's a lot of eco camps, and we're trying to help those eco camps in environmentally friendly tourist areas become real science stations. So we're getting them, we're actually funding them to have equipment in the, in the uh, jungles, equipment on the savannas, and to make sure that the, it's, scientists can't pay $300 a night to stay at a place. So you have to set aside like a scientist cabin. So, and then you, you integrate that in with the tourism so that tourists understand that that's part of the appeal is to talk to a scientist. And one of the things I'm doing on a big scale is I'm raising a million dollars for OBFS to have one paid staff. And then we'll start lobbying in the United States. But it's tricky because, like, if I go talk to D.C., I can't say, hey, please help these, um, these stations in Ireland. Like, I'm trying to build a fill station in Ireland. Why would D.C. would never help Ireland? I mean, they may like Ireland. They might send them a gift, but they're not going to send them half a million dollars. So. so it's tricky. We're trying to work with different governments. And this is a big problem regionally. You know, we have our problems in our island, and this is one of the things that's great that Marianne has started, is this collaboration. Because it's easy to care about your home, but it's hard to care about someone else's home, right? So it's important to actually collaborate with each other and, and raise everybody up, up at the same time. So this was a link to the movie that would have made it easier for you, but we can click on to the next one. So I work with, I just gave a big talk up in Boston for uh, like a TED talk. And one of the things I talked about was working with the unusual suspects. One thing that I do different than other scientists is I trust people under the age of 18 to do science. So a lot of other scientists think that kids are dumb and they're completely wrong. I think kids, kids being anyone from real, really about two to 20 are, are legitimate human beings that have a thought in their heads. So I do a lot of research with kids. Um, they're my primary workforce. And so they write papers with me. I have them out doing, instead of playtime camp stuff, they're really doing research that we then present and publish. So I've got students here that are helping me do some seining. Seining is using a large net to cat, catch fish. We'll cat, count the number of shrimp and silverside and menhaden and do a quantitative evaluation of how the fish species are doing in this area. And I'm short, so I'm right there. Um, I'm always the shortest one in any of these slides. Uh, unless they're like five, and then I'm usually taller. So this is um, policy work called beach profiling that I provide to the state. We, we are measuring the erosion of sand on the beaches, which is a huge problem in Martha's Vineyard, even bigger problem on Nantucket. Some areas are losing 10 feet per year. People are picking up their houses every year and moving them. So I've got students here from uh, inner city up in Lawrence that are helping me measure the change in elevation at this beach. So I actually present this data to the state and they use it for quantifying sand before they spend a million dollars to catch sand that's running away. So this is us in the middle of the night with our waders on and our headlamps and it is dark, dark because uh, we don't have as many lights as you have in Martha's Vineyard, we're out counting horseshoe crabs. So this is, this is a slunny meter, and we are, this is a clipboard, and we're getting ready to go count some horseshoe crabs and scare the poop out of all these students, because there's lots of fish that swim around in the dark, and you don't remember that when, until you're walking and you've got eels swimming around your feet, and you're like, oh, that's a little more exciting than I thought. Next. 
This is what we did yesterday. We went to this pond. It's surrounded with big, big houses with very, very rich people that have two nice lawns and have septic systems that they need to fix. So we're, these are two of my um, college age students helping us do water quality. So this is our water quality kit and of course we wear waders. And then this is an underwater shot showing lots of different marine invertebrates. This is a club sponge. These are, this is codium, this is sea lettuce. There's about 20 creatures inside this picture. And this is uh, Ryan, he is a high school student and he set up these little plates that we lower into the water and then we quantify what kind of inverts settle on them. And that tells us a whole bunch about the water quality because different invertebrates, which are just spineless creatures like this, and uh, different algaes will proliferate based on whether the water is good or bad. So you can pull this up and go, it's the same thing in a city. If you've got nothing but chipmunks and squirrels, you don't have a real habitat. If you've got a whole lot of different creatures, you've got a good habitat. It's the same thing for underwater creatures. So your diversity and your species richness tell you how clean the water is. So um, Ryan did a great job. He loves diving. So students come to me and they go, hey, I love diving. Who doesn't? Who does, raise your hand if you hate diving. Actually, me too. You and I both. I'm the only oceanographer. You're meeting the only oceanographer in the world who cannot swim. So you can swim. I'm, I'm actually a afraid of swimming. So that's if we're doing a, a, um, a profile in courage slash stupidity, I would probably write right at that level. So <laughs> I am very good at staying on the boat. So I go out on oceanographic cruises and I stay on the boat. I might jump down into the Zodiac and go way far from the big, and I might be in the middle of like the Pacific Ocean on a Zodiac. But boy, howdy, I can, I can hang on to that boat really well. Um, but a lot of people love diving, so I get a lot of students that want to come and dive, and I try to think of good research projects that let them have fun while learning more about the seafloor, right? Next. Um, this is what I've been famous for lately. I've been, Mark Ruffalo actually is my buddy, and we do talk on the phone, and he's like 10 times more awesome in real life than he is on TV, <laughs> if you can believe it. And I am working with him to do water quality science. So he runs something called Water Defense, which is a nonprofit trying to bring water quality science to the country. And so this is Raymond, one of our junior rangers, myself wearing almost the same outfit, and we're doing a big talk in front of 100 people at my field station. This is my classrooms right here, and that's how close we are to the edge. And so Mark and I are showing how this material picks up oil. So we're talking about how we can sequester oil in the water column. And we were just in LA Times last week. I was in the New York Times the week before. Um, we found, um, this is a horrible story, but in California, they're out of water, right? You guys know that? Okay. So what do you do if you're out of water and you have 30, 40% of the, the almond growth and the other veg vegetables and stuff that people are growing? You have to use water to feed these almond trees. So they've been buying water from Chevron after it's been quote unquote treated and they've been using this water on for agricultural purposes. And we found out that there is actually still benzene and ethyl, um, uh, ethylene, merc mercuric chloride, um, acetone, a bunch of stuff still in this water that shouldn't be in it. So um, I help assist him. I provide him scientific street cred to his organization. So, and I, <laughs> I, I, he really does call and go, Dr. Ote, what is this? Is this stupid or whatnot? And I go, no, that's good or, yep. You can do that with urine. Yeah, there are ways to treat any kind of water. No matter how bad it is, you can remove stuff. It's much easier to make urine drinkable than processing fluid from oil rigs because the problem is it's really hard to get all those light volatiles out of there. So they put it through these, these, co these walnut husks, and they were using some pretty cool technology to remove these contaminants, but the problem is they didn't check it well enough. And farmers are so desperate. They're like, I don't care. I want water at an affordable price, and it makes complete sense. I mean, they're really in a bind. Um, but w we don't want people eating food if it's got benzene, you know, a known carcinogen. So, but yeah, you can treat, you could give me any kind of water, and I could eventually get a treatment where at the end, even urine, where at the end you could drink it, and that I would drink it. Um, but this is not what I was quoted in the LA Times as saying, I wouldn't drink this water. So. Um, and the next, I also went on to say, we need to test the, the, the almonds and the, the peaches because different fruits might absorb them and they might not. If the fruit doesn't absorb the benzene and the carcinogens, then you could still eat it. But you'd want to know, right? So Chevron's like, we don't want to know. It's fine. 
it's fine. We wouldn't do anything bad, would we? We're an oil company. Why would we do anything bad? So, um, and Mark's a very good speaker. He came and did like a big long talk, and I'm taking him to OBFS and Rocky Mountain Biological Lab, which they show that place that said Gothic. That's where I get to go this fall. So he's going to come to that, and I'm helping bridge the gap between a celebrity and scientists, because honestly, most scientists would not work with a celebrity. So my talk in Boston was about working with unusual suspects. In this case, it was with kids, with the public and reporters, and it was with celebrities, because other scientists are afraid of celebrities. So, um, for, for a variety of reasons, but I, they're gonna get over this. This is me in a very, very not, not great look, um, wearing some waders with Scott Smith, who's um, Mark's um, chief scientist, and we're putting this material in this pond and this is called Opflex. It's a water sampler that sits there and it absorbs toxins over time. So a lot of what I do is deploy this. Yes? Water defense. Yeah, so go online to water defense and it'll, you'll see blogs about me and videos and all kinds of cool stuff. And he's got some great, he also does the 100% solutions, which is 100% renewable energy for the United States. So those are his two big deals. I'm trying to get him right now. I'm trying to also raise money to do a commercial with him and um, Robert Downey Jr. talking kids into doing science. Because I had Mark come work in my lab for about five or six hours, and I had to kick him out of my lab because he totally loves science. He's like, this is the most fun I've ever had, ever, ever. And I'm like, it's midnight. You have to go. Um, and he was, it was funny because they were putting on the white coats. I'm like, you know scientists never wear those, right? Okay. Uh, but no, he really loves science. So I'm trying to get him to do, a, a, wouldn't that be a great idea to have a commercial for kids that says, hey, you know, the Hulk and Iron Man like to do science. Why don't you? So, and he said he'd do it. I just have to fund it, of course, like most of life. Next. <laughs> so here is an oceanographic vessel that I commission. It's got a really great sonar and it's going up and down the coast and doing these, these imaging of oy um, oyster beds and eelgrass beds under the water. And so a lot of what I do is provide money or time or connections for scientists so they can get data that we can then use for policy. So almost everything I do is policy oriented, which I think is really important. If I get a lot of cool data and I just hide it you know, or share it with my three students, then it doesn't really make a difference. Next. This is what 90% uh, of our life is doing, is this water quality measurement. This is showing nitrate and phosphate in these different water bodies. And so nitrate comes from septic systems and phosphate from fertilizers. So I do a lot of water quality in groundwater, um, looking at nutrients, which can come from boats, septics, fertilizers. I also look at coliforms, which are straight from poop. And, uh, and I've actually gone to like yacht clubs and stuff and talked to very stuffy little, you know, older people and told them your, your poop is bad. And it's really funny when they're looking at me like, my poop is bad? Yeah, yeah. all of our, everyone poops and it's all bad. Um, fresh water, salt, and brackish water. So you gotta connect all of these things. Next. Um, I work, I also have a couple of interns that do some humpback whale research with me. So I try to set up collaboratives, in this case between a whale watch boat, my field station, and students that work for, um, the, in this case, the Plymouth, um, um, whale and conservation and do uh, whale, dolphin and uh, conservation society. So I try to hook up people and provide them housing. Something simple, because on Nantucket housing is impossible to get. So I provide a bed for students to stay and do their own science. So that, that, that's easy to do and makes me happy. Next. I've done some of this research myself. This is one of our bigger projects is gray seals. So gray seals are huge. This is a little Juvenile gray seal on Muskegon. So Muskegon's really close to Martha's Vineyard. Here's Martha's Vineyard. Here's Muskegon, Tuckernuck, and Nantucket. So Muskegon's this little island. No one lives there except about 10,000 seals. And so gray seals were almost completely extinct in our waters. They were down to zero in the 1950s because we shot them all and ate them all. Not only us, but the Wampanoags. You know, the Wampanoags started eating them, and we started eating them, and then they're all. And then the fishermen started shooting them because they think they steal all their fish. Sadly, there's a new, now that they've recovered, there's a new group of fishermen, and I'm also very famous for telling these people to change their mind. Um, there's a new group of fishermen that wants to kill the seals again. And they're called the Seal Abatement Coalition. And their job, they're, they're like, these seals are stealing my fish. I'm like, you have got to be a better fisherman. How, how about a fish? If you can't outfish a seal, well, I'm sorry for you. Um, and, but they're serious. They, want to, they, they grew up with no seals. So now they see all these seals, and to them, they seem invasive. They just want to go and shoot them? Yeah. 
basically. Some of them are so rich they actually want to build them their own islands further away. I know, how stupid is that? And this is just because of ignorance, right? So they grew up and they never saw a seal. If you saw a seal, it was like, call the, you know, call the press, it's so important. These people need to come in, come on in. So it's shocking, right? These guys want to roll back the Marine Mammal Protective Act. And you have to, part of that, come on in, no biters. Have a scooch or sit down, I'm almost done. I heard you guys are presenting next, right? All about science, can't wait. Um, so 90% of this is education, getting people to understand there used to be 100,000 seals around Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket and Muskegon, but then we reduced it to zero. Now they're back up to 15,000. This male seal weighs about 1,200 pounds. This female seal is about 800 pounds, so the female's the size of that couch. Yeah, that's about the size of the females. All of you guys are about the size of this little guy. Um, I've actually landed on this island and had to stealthy s sneak around the island and count the pups. And there were 2,000 pups. You would think it'd be easy to count seals. You would be totally wrong. Um, when you land on the island, all the dads run into the water. They're like, whatever, have my wife and kid. I don't care. Um, the, the females will kind of put up a fight. They'll like get in front of the babies and go, and they'll hiss at you. They don't bark. That's the sea lion thing. They'll go, Sss, and they're very scary, super scary. Um, definitely could bite your arm off. But then when you get too close, they go, oh, I can have another baby too. I'm just going to run into the water. And then the babies are sitting there going, mom, dad, what the heck? And then you go one, two, three, four, and you count them. So, uh, <laughs> but after, you know, like 500, they all look alike and they're all moving, right? They all don't just stand there while you count them. This one goes over there, this one, and you're like, did you get the white one with the black ear? I don't know. Um, so anyway, we counted all of these seals. And knowing the population is really important, right? And then getting that information out there. So I have to go talk to fishermen all the time who are very peeved and really hate scientists and don't want to hear what we have to say. And you have to say, listen, we looked at their stomachs and we also look at their poop, back to poop, right? We collect their poop, this is a very exciting job. You go around and you collect seal poop and then you count all the fish ears because that's the only thing they can't digest. All fish have a little ear bone inside their little ears. And you can look at the fish ear bones and it'll tell you what type of fish it is. So one person, not me, but another scientist that's a marine biologist, see how fun marine biology is? They count the fish ears, and they go, look, it's all sand lance. It's all a herring. It's not your stripers. It's not your shad. It's not your fish. It's other fish. And so that information is important, right? So then it stops being an anecdote, and you're fighting fire with fire. You're fighting fear with science, right? So um, I have to go give a talk all the time with lots of fishermen that want to kill me. But usually by the end of the talk, they were closer to being maybe not buddies, but at least liking each other. Next. Here's uh, the horseshoe crab counting. There's a tag on that horseshoe crab. Do you guys see, of course, on Martha's Vineyard, you got a lot of horseshoe crabs? Yeah, yeah they're awesome. They're coming back. That's a whole other fishery story that I won't get into, but we almost killed all them because they had no protection. Nobody protected them. Mm -hmm. They are. There was absolutely no regulations, and now Massachusetts is passing regulations to limit them out because they're cutting up these beautiful historic, prehistoric. These are definitely Jurassic Park world, you know, 270 million year old creatures. They're cutting them out for the conch bait and lobster bait. I live next to a fish market, and we actually found a horseshoe crab in my backyard that had escaped the fish market. Oh. <laughs> Walked all the way to our house. It's hilarious. Yeah. Hiking. <laughs> good, good. Well, and they come ashore. The only time they come ashore is to lay eggs, too. Normally they're deep water creatures. So not only are you killing them randomly, but you're killing them right when they're trying to lay eggs. Um, I've got a woman coming that's going to give a talk about red knots, which are a type of um, shorebirds, and they depend almost exclusively on horseshoe crab eggs to survive. So all, you know how good birders are about screaming about things? Well, birders really are helping because they notice all the red knot population nose diving. And that's because they had nothing to eat because we were eating all the horseshoe or we were killing all the horseshoe crabs. It's, and it's really wasteful. It's like using, I don't know, a uh, hundred dollar bill to buy a piece of candy. It's just really dumb to use a creature that's in this case probably 30 years old to catch a lobster. It's just dumb. You, there's a million ways you could catch it. I work a lot with scallops, bay scallops, and you guys have bay scallops over here in Martha's Vineyard. In fact, I work sometimes with the hatchery and with the Vanderhoops and folks over here that are raising bay scallops. We have even a healthier bay scallop fishery over in Nantucket, and we do a lot of work diving, checking out eelgrass, and uh, checking out the scallops and making sure they're healthy. I've got two doctoral students that have been doing their research for about six years on scallops. Scallops are a big deal. Uh, next. 
sorry, I'm talking so long. You guys okay on time? I got like three more, okay. This is a water buoy. This is so I don't have to bob around in the water all day with solar panels on my head looking at the temperature. So I let a, a machine do it for me and then it streams onto the internet. So a lot of things that I put out are actually buoys that record the data and they put it on the internet so that everyone can get the data in real time. And that's, uh, Mark's actually a big fan of that too, is providing data in an interface where anyone can access it. So students can use it for their research and where scientists can use it for research. We also do some work with ocean acidification which you guys might know of, it's a big issue over in Hawaii, the ocean, you know, because of the CO2 is in the atmosphere, it's getting into the ocean and causing carbonic acid to go up. So the oceans worldwide have gone down in pH, 0 0.075 pH units. That's the equivalent of about 200,000 tanker trucks of hydrochloric acid being dumped into the oceans. So now creatures have to rebuild their shells faster. In some cases, their shells will collapse. Um, in some cases, they'll, uh, their meat will get smaller because they're spending so much time rebuilding their house. So the way I, the metaphor I use is, let's say you've got shingles on a house and every time you put up shingles, somebody comes and steals two every day. You know, every day you're like, okay, two more shingles. That's the same thing. These, these bivalves are having to put more energy into building their shells. Some of them are really good at it and get really tough and other ones die. And it's really bad. Coral reefs, it really messes up coral reefs. So this rising sea surface temperatures also are accelerating algae blooms, which are blocking out sunlight to beneficial algae, and they're driving some fish further offshore. So some fish can't take the heat, and so they go offshore. Now the good thing for those fish is it's getting them away from fishermen. The bad thing is that it's changing the whole ecosystem, because everything that eats those fish is around shore going, why can't I find my shad? So the sh seals are confused. They're like, well, I'll go steal this fisherman's you know, fish that he just reeled up, because I can't find the fish that was in the water. So they're all linked, right? All of these problems. Next. Here's the harmful algae blooms, which you can't see quite as well in this, but this is from the, the air. This is a bright rust-colored tide, and it's called rust tide of Cochlidinium polycretes. Um, it causes uh, base scallops to fail as juveniles, kills baby base scallops. Um, it's really ridiculous, and it's only caused by two people's lawns, caused this entire algae bloom which almost wiped out our entire fisheries. Two ding-dongs, one lawn, two lawns, that much problem. This is even worse. This is called blue-green algae. You guys uh, read about Toledo having the issue with their water. You know, in the Great Lakes, there was a big blue-green algae bloom, and they had to shut down all the water. That's from this creature. So this is a bacterium, and this grows when there's too much nutrients. And this is the one that's starting to be linked to Lou Gehrig's disease. So the same thing that, you know, several people have had that really wipes them out. So we're trying to find ways to keep these two things from happening. Next. Here's what we're going to be doing in two weeks. Doing a, uh, we do a dredge, a tow. This is a spider crab. We've got scallops. This is our classes in the summertime. So it's not all research. It's also about classes. I have college classes that run year round. So we start doing research in spring all the way to December. And you can get about 45 credits of class there on Nantucket. And that's one of the things that Martha's Vineyard has been looking at is trying to have college classes here on island so you can make that transition to college off island easier, right? So if it's closer to home, then you can work and kind of make that transition, which sometimes is hard. So this is a lot of fun. This is my students having a great day instead of standing in waders in the middle of a pond. Next. This is the much harder version of it. This is in February. Same students. Freezing their you know what off uh, stand. This is my view from my, my field station. So this is Nantucket Harbor. Right past here is the sound. Here's two of our college students collecting mussels in um, very challenging circumstances. But this is important, right? Because any, any old dude can go collect scallops in the middle of summer when it's nice and you're off school. This is really helpful science that we're not getting enough of when the, when the weather's not as good. Next. Um, I do a lot of work with coastal resiliency. This is my, my, my marsh in the middle of Hurricane Sandy, and that's a huge barrier beach that's completely underwater. This is actually on CNN, and you can see waves breaking in. So it's, this barrier beach has not stopped the harbor from getting into the marsh. So now we're measuring how does the marsh recover and can it recover? Because the marsh protects the upland from storm damage. And, um, it's really critical to figure out what's happening. Uh, so this is one of the things that I can shoot out of my window when I have no power. Okay, next. Really cool ant or spider coming down the... Cool. So here's Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard. This is, you can't quite see it, but this is all sand from Sandy. 
and it's all washed off the islands, and you can actually see it from space. So this is the same thing in Nemo, and you can see, oh, sorry it's not darker, but all on that side, you can see, see all the sand, well, the snow is really nuts. See all that light color in the ocean? That's all sand. That's all erosion. When you see it from space, you're like, oh my goodness, that's a lot of sand. So that is reproportioning all of the sand on the islands and blowing them offshore and forming new shoals. There's the information on where to get that. Next. So how do we change policy and make a difference? I don't believe in just doing science. I believe in doing science for a reason. So some of the things that we've managed to do on island, we've got fertilizer regulations that have come out of our lab and out of our efforts. We've managed to make docks and piers illegal on Nantucket because docks shade eelgrass and cause base scallops to die. So the only kind of dock you can have now is a public dock. You can't have a private dock. So it's to avoid gentrification. You don't want to go, what's really I really like this about Martha's Vineyard, there's still a lot of the island that's for everyone, right? You don't go to a portion of the shore and it's only rich people that own that portion, right? And there is in some areas, but we're trying to keep that so it's not the whole island on Nantucket. So now it's illegal to stop people from walking because you're too more important and you have your own dock. Um, and people would do that. If we didn't have this rule, they would totally fill up the whole harbor with dogs. Balloons are now banned. Styrofoam's banned. Plastic bags are banned on Nantucket. Um, we do a lot of work protecting the wetlands in the harbor, a lot of work on fisheries, Ed educating the public about marine mammals so they don't want to shoot them all, and showing people the effects of climate change. Next. I think that's it. Yay. <laughs> okay. Thank you guys very much. Great questions. Thanks for including me in your day today. I'm excited to see what you guys have to say. Yes. Um, I missed a little bit of that ocean certification, but I wanted to ask yeah. about that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I met somebody who was making this machine that basically operates on its own. And it just goes up and down with the water, but it creates like oxygen sort of in it. It oxygenates the water. Yeah. Um, he was saying that that sort of combats ocean acidification by putting more oxygen in the ocean, which combats the carbon dioxide. But I don't know if he's right on that. I'm Doesn't not like sure. Good. Yeah. Chemically, it won't really bind the carbon dioxide. Um, it will temporarily change the redox state, but then it'll change back again before it has time for it to bubble out. It's, what you would want to do is actually ca cause CO2 to go back. But if you cause CO2 to go back into the atmosphere, it's an equilibrium state. So CO2 is just going to turn right. It's just like a turtle trying to cross the road. It doesn't matter how many times you pick it up. It's going to get back and go the same way. Carbon dioxide is going to go up and then turn right back around. So what you need to do is take up that carbon dioxide permanently. So if you had floating um, greenhouses in the ocean that were algae that weren't harmful, then those would be little power plants that would take up the, uh, and so they've been looking at like living floating rafts that take up that carbon dioxide and then raise the pH. So if you have certain types of algae that'll raise the pH permanently. So I think his thing is, his thing would work well in a pond where you have to worry about dissolved oxygen profiles and that's when you want to tie up phosphate. So it would work well in freshwater. I'm not sure, I'll, I'll read up about it because there's, there's another really great kid that's like your all's age that's looking at removing plastics from the ocean, from the, the great plastic garbage dump. But the problem is his system would actually pick up a lot of algae and a lot of creatures, too. So it's hard to design something that um, is related to something like that without hurting something else. So, but I'm all, I love engineers. I love engineering thought. I think you guys are the open-minded folks that are going to make us stop doing dumb things and do the right thing. So when I talk to people your age about any kind of, like everything the Supreme Court did last week, all of you guys are like, well, duh. You know, instead of older people are like, this is the dumbest side. You know, you guys definitely understand why the environment's important, right? I don't have to go to and explain to you why clean air is nice and, you know, clean water is a good idea or why different creatures. Uh, Fifty years ago, people were like, I need to feed my family. I need to be a coal miner. You know, I, I need to work for the oil. My, I'm from an oil family. My whole family made money in selling fossil fuels. So um, it's really great that you guys are, are, are smart about this kind of stuff. So, More questions, Celeste? Yeah. yeah. Um, what do you think is like, the hardest part about resource management? Is it policy or enforcement? Enforcement's very hard. Like with the balloon ban, um, we have a lot of people who are like, well, I'm just going to sneak balloons over in the middle of the night. I'm like, dudes, if you really want to have illegal balloons for your child's party, then 
I'm not going to show up at your house and with a <laughs> pin and, you know. So, uh, though we thought about it, there is one person on Nantucket for 20 years has walked around, grabbed people's balloons, and popped them. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to quite do that. Uh, enforcement's usually, it's easy to make a law. It's hard to make people want to follow a law. The litter law is a really good example. People know littering's bad, but it's very easy to throw it out of your car. And it's only if you enforce it in intelligent ways and then you make people, what I'm thinking about for the fertilizers is doing a calendar of all the good lawns on Nantucket that rich people own that are nice. So people can go, oh, look, I can have a nice lawn. So it's, it's kind of like they're not trying to keep up with the Joneses and have this super green lawn that you can see from space, but they can have a xeriscape lawn that they develop that's all native plants. It doesn't have to be watered. And so I think it's sometimes smarter to, revo to reward the people doing good than punish the bad people. Um, regulations, it's not terribly hard to get a regulation through. Once again, it's all about education. My fertilizer bill, I tried to bring a bill to the town government to town meeting with a thousand people there and I had an eighth grader there to help me describe about this um, why fertilizers are bad and this eighth grader was so brave they had people calling pro fertilizer people calling her parents telling her parents they were bad people for letting her go in front of town meeting and you know they almost threatening her parents so this girl still showed it for fertilizers please anyway this girl shows up and um, pushes me for a year to bring it to town meeting I had all these landscapers get up and go, you never talked to us, we weren't included in the regulations. Well, I had, but I said, okay, we'll hold it for a year, you guys all make a big committee and you write the regulations, and they did. So it came back and those regulations they wrote, you couldn't say they weren't fair, and so then they had to follow them. So now on Nantucket, you have to be a licensed landscaper, you have to at least say that you've read all the rules and you understand them, which means no phosphate, phosphate's not allowed on Nantucket unless you prove you can need it. Um, but that's, that's a really good question. It's a constant battle, and I have to pick my battles. You know, and sometimes I'm mean, and sometimes I'm nice. <laughs> so, yes? Is there anyone doing your type of work on the vineyard? No, that's one of the things I'd like to do long term. I was just talking to my friend at Smithsonian. I've been talking with Marianne. I know a lot of the conservation groups on island. I would love to start a field station here. There's a lot of individual scientists doing some of the work, and I do a little consulting for Martha's Vineyard, but we really need a field station, and we need one of you guys, maybe, to be me here on Martha's Vineyard. I think uh, it's such a great ecosystem. It's really important. You guys have some, uh, I come and do moth trapping, and I do some work with snakes and stuff on, on this island. Um, I think that you guys could really use a hand. And you guys have even more interesting and difficult water quality issues here. So I'm, I'm really interested in getting that going. Yes. I think there is one, maybe two, on the big island. And when I'm sitting down listening to you guys, I'm going to look those up because my friend Mel Dean works for one at the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and I think she's on the big island. Um, it's actually with part of the forestry service, so she's in a very quiet part of the big island, right where there's a big forest, forested area. And um, so that, I think, is our primary one. I think we also have one on Oahu and maybe on Kauai. I think I so. saw a shot of HIMB in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's there. It looked like there was at least two locations. That's one of the reasons I wanted to show this. I've become uh, the field station director since I've been to Hawaii, but she's now our secretary for OBFS. And so she's really young, and I'm trying to get her to uh, go up in the organization. So that's one of the things. Uh, my organization is really good about being very open to everyone. We're not very sno snooty. Um, in fact, it's funny. When we go to other meetings where the scientists are snooty, we have a hard time because we don't understand how people can't be fun. So, uh, but she's really awesome, and I'll look up her contact information. I think she's just on the Big Island. Yeah, she does a lot of work with invasive plants and with agriculture. So, like on Nantucket, I do a lot of terrestrial. People think I'm all about the water, but I do a lot of terrestrial science, which is important too. But there's tons of uh, marine labs. So Duke has a good one. If you guys are going into college, look at whatever college you guys pick and see if there's a field station associated. And if you can get out to it, definitely go to it. More questions? Nope. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. Thanks.